Good morning. Welcome to Wesley United Methodist Church. We are so glad you're here to worship God with us here on this Sunday morning. And we would love for you to spread some Christian love. So could you please turn to a neighbor and let them know you are glad they are here? Yes, good, whoa. <laughs> good morning and welcome to Wesley United Methodist Church this morning. We just want to draw your attention to a few things in your bulletin. That uh, connection card in there, the little white piece of paper is a great way to connect with the church and for us to connect with you. So if there's something going on and you want to be a part of it, go ahead and write it down there. Or maybe you have a prayer request. We love to pray for you. Write that in there and then put it in the offering plate as it goes by. Uh, next week, there's a ton going on, uh, and two of those things are next Sunday. Next Sunday's Basket Ministry Sunday, and if you would like to deliver a basket to someone, write that on your connection card or let Pastor Janice know, um, and that is a first come, first serve type of thing next week. If you want to help put those together, the committee is meeting on Saturday, so you can join them at 10 o'clock, and they're going to put those baskets gets together. And also next Sunday, children, you and your families, whoever you um, consider to be family, come on over. We're going to have dinner together and do some Lenten activities. And that starts at 4.30 and goes till 6.45 maybe. But we're going to make soft pretzels and do some fun things in the fellowship hall. And we are almost, we're just about a week away from uh, Shrove Tuesday and Ash Wednesday. And so we'd like to draw your attention to those events. On Shrove Tuesday, we will have a pancake dinner uh, here at the church. It's from 5 to 7. And so, and that is going to take place at the Wednesday dinner that week. So if you're hungry, come out to a pancake dinner on Tuesday, uh, the 25th from 5 to 7. We'd love to have you. Um, we'll have pancakes and bacon and some other goodies. I'm sure so come out to that and then Wednesday is Ash Wednesday and so um, from noon to one Pastor Tom will be in the chapel uh, for an imposition of ashes there and then he will have an Ash Wednesday service here in the sanctuary at six o'clock so um, if you're looking for an Ash Wednesday service those are your opportunities here at Wesley and we invite you to attend those with us and that's what we would like to share with you this morning, so now let us prepare our hearts for worship.
us stand together in body or in spirit as we join together in the call to worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Blessed are those who seek God, whose hearts are set on God's commandments. We are of God's law and heirs God's Spirit permeates our human scene, lifting us above our jealousies and quarreling. We reach the In all we do, God offers us choices between good and evil, between life and death. In worship, we encounter God's commandments and explore together what it means to love God. together the prayer of the day. God of our ancestors, whose power to bless or to destroy has not diminished through the vastness of time, help us to hear your high expectations of us without defensiveness or denial, that we may be open to the changes you require, respond in ways that bring life, and working together, become your community of spiritual people who have something special to offer to your world. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. Paul is addressing the divisions in the Corinthian church and the two leaders upon whom the divisions are based. And he begins by letting the people know they are not as wise and spiritual as they may think. And so, brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now you are still not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are not you merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants, through whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose, and each will receive wages according to their labor of each. For we are God's servants servants working together. You are God's field, God's building. May this be a reminder, even in the midst of divisions, of our common purpose and work for the kingdom of God. And as we sing the next hymn, Children Who Wish may go to Children's Church.
Let us stand together in posture or heart as we hear the gospel for today coming to us from Matthew's account, the fifth chapter, beginning with the 21st verse and reading through the 37th verse. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, <clears throat> You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, You fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him. Or your accuser may hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks. You may be seated. Every now and again, uh, someone will say to me that they uh, appreciate the way I talk intentionally about the Bible and about Jesus. Uh, however, after hearing what Jesus has to say today, a person might want to hear less from Jesus and not more. Uh, try as I might to be on Jesus' side and to keep all of you on Jesus' side as well, Jesus, if you haven't noticed, isn't always easy to take. A person might even be inclined to say, you know, this is the Sunday we all came to church thinking we were good Christians, and then we listened to the scripture and we found out that we weren't. A little girl was drawing a picture, and uh, her dad said to her, What are you drawing? She said, I'm drawing a picture of God. Well, you know, he said, um, nobody knows what God looks like. Well, she said, uh, they will when I get done. <laughs> well, Jesus draws us a very particular picture of God. 
And I'm intrigued by folks, and sometimes I think I'm one of them, who seem to be looking for an easy, manageable, attractive God who likes what they like and cares about what they care about and blesses what they bless and the people they think should be blessed. But the God we get today from the Scripture seems rather particular, somewhat demanding, and not especially inclined to follow anybody's lead, not yours or mine or anybody's. We are for the third Sunday in a row listening in on what is essentially Jesus' inaugural address, the Sermon on the Mount. What Matthew appears to be doing here is to inform us of what Jesus is all about. If you want to know God and, and you're taking Jesus seriously, then this is what God is all about. And so we don't get to make it up ourselves. It's common these days, I think, to hear people say, I'm spiritual, <clears throat> but I'm not religious. And what that often means, I think, is that they're open to God and they're open to others and they're open to the things they can't always see, but they don't want to be tied down to anything too particular. And while we Christian preachers are trained to be a little bit crabby about that kind of thing, I've come to the conclusion that perhaps the best thing to do is to appreciate the spirituality and affirm it and go on trying my best to keep on expressing the particular nature of God as revealed in Jesus. So here it is, uh, our bit of particularity for today. Not all of it, but some of it. You have heard it said, Jesus says. Now, when you hear Jesus go to saying you have heard that it was said, you can be pretty sure he's about to take conventional wisdom and lay it on its side. Maybe even turn it on its head. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder. Well, that's fine. That's great. What a relief. I'm feeling good. Most of us are just fine with a God like that. Most of us, I think, can be attest, can, can attest to not being murderers. So um, check that box. We're doing okay. But now, calling people names, that's getting a little picky, don't you think? Insulting people, well, that's just human. Anger, well, uh, how do you expect me not to be angry with people sometimes? They can be pretty testy, after all. And adultery, well, sure. You know, most of us can accept a God who frowns on adultery. I, I suspect that even a number of people who have committed adultery have, can accept that God wasn't exactly happy about that. So, okay. But now, looking at another person with lust... That's just what people do, right? Some people just look good, and the rest of us look at them. That's just what happens. And there aren't a lot of people who have managed not to look at another person with lust at least one time. And that certificate of divorce just meant doing it the proper way. And something as difficult and complex as divorce ought to be handled the proper way. But divorce translating into adultery? Now, now Jesus has gone knocking on quite a few good people's doors with some rather bad news. And uh, don't swear falsely using God's name. That's fair. It's God's reputation we're dealing with, after all. But don't swear an oath at all. Let your yes be yes and your no be no every single time. Say what you mean and say what is honest. And don't add to it or twist it around every single time. No exceptions. Anything more comes from the evil one. I think I'm starting to understand the spiritual but not religious folks a little more. Give me a, a God who's easier to take. 
You know, Jesus has quite the nerve saying stuff like this. Who can stand to be judged by such a standard? How can we do it? Does Jesus want us to fail? This God that Jesus represents is no generalized, generic, build it the way you want it God. When we talk about a Judeo-Christian tradition, we're talking about a very particular God. The Ten Commandments don't allow us to just make it up ourselves. The law given to the ancient Hebrews doesn't allow us to just make it up ourselves. And now Jesus comes waltzing in with the audacity to say, as he did last Sunday, that our righteousness must exceed that of those who know and practice the law and the commandments most faithfully of all. And what he seems to be getting at, if I'm anywhere near to right, is that God places an immeasurably high value on relationships. That sort of notion permeates what Jesus is saying today. Righteousness, from the standpoint of the Bible, means right relationship. It's about what people do to each other. It's about how they treat one another. The Ten Commandments and the law were given to the Hebrew people in order to provide a framework for people to live together in a manner that would promote the least harm and the most good for all. In the case of today's words, Jesus takes the Hebrew law he's learned and pushes it even harder and sets the bar even higher. And it makes me wonder, it makes me wonder if he didn't do that, if he just simply left us to our own devices and to what we know, would we be inclined to just excuse ourselves too often and stop trying? But he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that because anger burns. Anger burns, justified or unjustified. Anger will eat away and eat away and eat away at the angry person as well as the one who is the object of the anger. Anger will make us do things and say things we wish we hadn't done or said. Anger that's gone on and on and on for too long and that won't let go of us or that we won't let go of will kill us. Insults hurt. Words hurt. Sticks and stones may break our bones, says author Robert Fulgham, but words will break our hearts. Calling somebody an idiot or a fool or some other name gives me an excuse to push myself farther away from that person, to dismiss her or him as if they weren't a person, just a nothing. And we live in a culture that allows words, more and more critical words and condemning words to fly around like bullets and bombs. Words about people who are different from us. Words about people who don't agree with me. Careless words in our homes and our schools and our workplaces and our public places. If only every one of us would go home today and simply commit ourselves to exercising care over the words that we print, the words that come out of our mouths. We did no more than that. If only we might put more effort into our marriages and our committed relationships. If only we might see other people as people and not merely as objects. If only we were to conduct ourselves in a way that others would know they can trust us. Jesus is as concerned about what's happening on the inside of us where nobody can see 
as he is about what's happening on the outside of us where everybody can see. And Jesus won't let us get out of here today without thinking, you know, maybe I need to improve. Nor will he let us point the finger at murderers and adulterers and habitual liars and all the other people we're eager to condemn and go home thinking, oh, I've aced the test and I am justified in condemning these bad ones. And who knows? Who, who really knows? Maybe, maybe Jesus says all these things he says today because he believes in us more than we believe in ourselves. Maybe he dares to talk on this way because he really thinks we can do better and be better. Sometimes we think, you know, I really can't be that good. I really can't. You, you're better than me and I can't be that good. Yes, you can. Yes, I can. Underneath all this judgment that cuts to the core today, maybe Jesus is paying us a compliment. Maybe we ought to walk out of here today feeling every bit as affirmed as we feel challenged. Maybe we ought to get up and go from here standing tall, figuring, you know, Jesus really thinks quite a bit of me and quite a bit of all of us after all. He believes we can be better. I can say this, Jesus loves so much, he loves so much, and his love is so demanding that you and I can't really help recognizing our frailty and our failure and our brokenness. And so also our need for forgiveness and grace. And it just so happens the particular God with whom we are brought face to face today turns out to be just that. A God who is rich in forgiveness and grace. That's the good news. We won't die with this very particular God. We'll live. By God's grace, we'll live. So let's be encouraged, and let's never give up. Amen. As we pray now, I invite you during the prayer when I pray the phrase, Lord, in your mercy, to respond by praying the phrase, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Now let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as Christ loves us. Lord, in your mercy. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. 
Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. We offer these prayers through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has taught us to pray as we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this moment, as you are um, reaching for your treasure, I uh, invite Delaney Goddard to come and share a ministry moment about the Super Bowl of Caring. So, two weeks ago, we collected money for this... Um, we collected money in cans of soup for our local... Er, oh. <laughs> <laughs> for a local Charleston food pantry and the high school food pantry. Due to the generosity of this congregation, we were able to provide both food pantries with roughly about 50 cans, as well as a monetary donation, about $275. Thank you for helping the church to love of Christ in our community by supporting these local food pantries as we partner with them and help those in our community that need our help. Thank you. Now, as a people who are seeking to grow in generosity, who are uh, propelled forward by the challenges and the love of Jesus Christ, let us offer our gifts with happy hearts. <laughs>
together this prayer of dedication. Faithful God, we give in gratitude for your abundant gifts to us. As we offer our tokens of thanks today, we hear you sending us out to mend broken relationships. Our offering is not a substitute for our own engagement in your reconciling work. Go with us to help us as we accept the assignments you give us. Amen. words to you and may the Holy Spirit empower you to rise to the challenge of doing God's reconciling work in this world go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Jesus Christ Amen